Will you cease from sinning? Now that might seem to be a bit facetious in view of the fact that we all, from time to time, due to weakness and ignorance, transgress God's law. But that's not what we're talking about because we all know and I don't know of a faithful child of God that does not want to cease from any sin. Sins of ignorance or weakness. That's what we long for, to be in heaven where that won't be anymore. It's very difficult to think about a place where sin does not transpire, where nobody can be tempted to break God's law, where there's no need for forgiveness, there are none of the consequences of sin, which here in this earth are myriad. Ultimately, sin unforgiven separates from God. And dying in that case, then eternal separation from God takes place. But in the, Bi in the Bible, God has specifically designated certain thoughts and actions to be sin. Fornication, idolatry, covetousness, strife, drunkenness, murder, lying to others and ourselves, backbiting, false accusations, lack of respect for authority and those in authority, blaming our sins on others, which was one that was committed right in the beginning, and more. And that's what these scriptures cover here which we're not going to attempt to read right now but certainly write them down and there there are others like them that specify no uncertain terms sin we've often said and will continue to say that sin's man's greatest problem because it's the only thing that when we leave this life guilty of it unforgiven we'll lose our soul it's the only thing that can cause that and we know that there are sins of omission, leaving undone what God obligates us to do regarding salvation, sins of commission, transgressing God's will, John 4:17, 1 John 3:4. Scriptures also present very clear instruction regarding sin, and it's to be expected that those in the world will certainly reject that instruction. Their interest is not there. When we seek to preach the gospel to every creature, we're looking, as preachers used to say a lot of times, for a few good and honest hearts, Luke 8, 15. Because they're the only ones that will receive the word, the seed of the kingdom, and keep it. However, sadly, many Christians seem to ignore this as well. I think the, one of the greatest things the devil can sell a member of the church is, well, I'm a member of the church. I was baptized for the remission of my sins. I meant it, and I was sincere when I did it, and I understood what I was doing. And I know the Lord added me to his church, and I know I'm in the realm where he locates all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, sonship and forgiveness of sins being one of them, Ephesians 1.3. And after all, I'm in a state of favor or grace by being in Christ. So I don't have to really be that concerned about these things. But I can't find that I don't have to be really concerned about these things set out anywhere in the Bible. Living in the flesh means it's possible for us to sin. 1 John 1, uh, verse 10, all the way through chapter 2 and verse 1. John writes to Christians when he says that. He doesn't write to people out in the world who don't know Christ, who are outside of Christ, alien sinners. But the Scriptures teach us that we're called to be perfect, that is, spiritually complete, as our Heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus said, when He says, Be ye perfect, in Matthew 5.48. That's what my emphasis is in this hour when I ask, ought you, can you, will you cease from sinning? Now, is it possible to stop habitually and purposely sinning? 
I think everybody has to reach that stage or heaven won't be our home. How can you see one who scripturally wears the name Christian, remembering it means one who is of Christ, and then can go out and say, yeah, I know I broke God's law, but, and never try to repent of it, never try to confess it, never try to do anything about what God says one ought to do. And again, I say I'm speaking to church members. Do you remember the woman taken in the very act of adultery? And you remember that thing was all set up to try to entrap Jesus, but you don't entrap Jesus. He entraps you. And at the end of the whole thing, the woman had definitely transgressed God's wall, a law. She was taken in the very act of adultery. But Jesus told her, Go thy way. Now think about this. And sin no more. Did he ask of her what was impossible for her to do? Because she was as a Jew in covenant relationship with God. That's how the Jews then properly approached God. Church hadn't been established yet. Christ was still alive. As long as he walked this earth, he approached God under the law of Moses. Go thy way and sin no more. Is that not food for thought? Paul was very clear when he commanded the brethren in Corinth to stop sinning. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 34. That's what he says. Yet we have passages throughout the Bible, and I think especially the New Testament, passages throughout the New Testament that mention the sin of the brethren. How do you read very far in any New Testament letter to the brethren and not read about some sins they were committing? Now, in the previous chapter... He reminded them that the instructions that He revealed to them were the commandment of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37. So we recognize this command is having originated with God when Paul said to the church there, Stop sinning. Well, this begs the question, Would God give us a command that we could not obey? And the answer to that, no, he wouldn't do that. The answer to that is, is no. And John said, his commandments are not grievous. That is, God's commandments, that which we are to obey, that which is necessary to becoming a Christian, and now I speak to those in Christ, they're not burdensome. 1 John 5, 3, how, how is that possible? When you know that God in the New Testament has set out the only way men can get to heaven. And you understand there's not anything authorized for us to do in the New Testament. Not any commandment He has given us that is against us. That is opposed to us. Then that takes a lot away from saying, well that commandment's a burden for me to obey. I just can't do that, or I can't consistently do that, or I can't steadfastly keep doing that. Because you know everything there is to lead you to heaven. Have you ever heard of the game that I think it's called the scavenger hunt, where you run all over the place and you got to find uh, this hairbrush here and this high heel shoe over there, and you're driving here and looking there and all of that? Well, that's just a game. Yet we'll do that. And if we want to win it, we'll go to all these places and gather up all of these frivolous things just in the name of a game. But God has set out the last will and testament of His Son. And Jesus has said of Himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Me. John 14 and verse 6. And thus no man is going to come to the Father, and no man's going to remain faithful, except that he abide in the teachings of the New Testament. That's made the difference in the Lord's church and all that that implies, all that that means, and denominational churches for a long time. Because their views and their doctrines pretty much says, well, you can't do all that anyway. And uh, even the liberals in the church, I've been charged with being a commandment keeper as if that's supposed to make me ashamed of myself. 
I remember one time when we were in a lectureship many years ago, Brother Woods was speaking, and also Brother Deaver was there, two old war horses in the faith. And Brother Deaver remembered a time when Brother Woods had been in a debate with a Baptist preacher on the doctrine of once saved, always saved. That is a doctrine that says that it's impossible for a child of God to sow sins to be eternally lost. And the Baptist preacher had responded to Brother Woods by saying, Why, you teach a doctrine that has you just barely ahead of the devil and he's nipping at your heels. Brother Woods, and this is what Brother Deaver wanted Brother Woods to say to the audience. Brother Woods responded in his inimitable way and said, Well, why you have characterized the teaching of the New Testament on faithful Christian living and how one abides in the grace of God contrary to the truth of the New Testament. It certainly beats Baptist doctrine which says you can run neck and neck at the devil and get there. And that's basically what denominational doctrines do in some of my own brethren who have repudiated the authority of the New Testament or that the New Testament is not a divine pattern, uninspired blueprint. That's what they're doing and trying to make you feel bad by calling you a legalist. Do you know that Jesus never condemned the Pharisees for binding with the law of Moses and the law of Moses only bound upon the people? He never did. What made them Pharisees, is the reason that term is such a bad word today, is that they taught their traditions as if it were the law of Moses. And in doing so, when those traditions were contrary to the law of Moses, they set aside the law of Moses. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. That's what he got into them about because they held those up to be more potent and powerful and authoritative than did the actual teaching of the law of Moses. So John said that the commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome to him. Because I know that every commandment of Christ is designed to get me to heaven. It's that simple. And that removes the burden. That's for my good. Have you ever had to go to the doctor and the doctor prescribed something? Yeah, I remember when, I don't think I would have got to be six years old hadn't been for medicine, especially penicillin. But I can to this day remember Mama giving me medicine that was the awfulest tasting stuff that was ever possible. And mother did not take no for an answer when it came to that. I can remember sort of wanting to do like this and I knew that if I did that much very long she'd have hold my nose and cram it down. I can remember the back of the spoon hitting my epiglottis or whatever it is back there as it went down. And awful, ooh, it tasted awful. Well now she'd love me. She wouldn't have put me through that. She would have said, no, you don't have to take that. Well, we know better than that, but it's very simple, but very powerful too, to get a point across. Now, earlier in Paul's first letter to Corinth, he reminded the brethren of a very basic fact about sin and temptation. We should remember it as we live Christian life. Now, remember, this is to the church that he said this. There's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Now I'll tell you our problem with this verse once we understand the message he's getting over to us, which is really a message of comfort. He's telling us that God has equipped us to be able to deal with temptation and that any solicitation for us to do evil or any trying of our faith is something that we can bear and we can deal with. The problem is, is that we don't look many times, well, I won't say that, I'll say many times we don't look for the solution the Bible has. We try to find our own solution. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 again. But nevertheless, that tells us 
that we ought to be doing that. Now, another point. The faithfulness of God guarantees that there will be a way of escape with every temptation. Now, I need to ask this question to drive my point home. you believe that? Do you believe what Paul said to the Corinthians years ago in this part of the New Testament of Christ? That God's faithful and He guarantees there will be a way of escape with every temptation. Doesn't that encourage you? Isn't it meant to say you can handle it? Sometimes people do things and they get upset and whatever. And we say, they'll get over it. They'll get over it. Well, when you think about this for a moment, with every temptation, if we're faithful to God to begin with, we're living the Christian life. With every temptation, there's a way of escape. Am I going to be tempted? But what do I know beforehand when I'm going to be tempted? Because I know I'm going to be tempted. The same Bible that says there's a way of escape says I'll be tempted. I already know it beforehand what? There's a way of escape. There's a way of escape. And you know, that's strengthening within itself. I remember one time when I was visiting with Brother G.K. Wallace about debating. And he said, you know, and Brother Woods told me this too. He says, you know, Brother Brown, when you're studying for a debate like you ought to and getting ready for it, then there's very little your opponent is going to pull on you you're not ready for. And that's so true. But Brother Wallace added this to it. He said just in case your opponent does pull a verse out you weren't quite familiar with, since you know you're affirming the truth, you know that verse does not support his error. Take it away from him and teach the truth with it because it harmonizes with what you are affirming because what you are affirming is the truth. Because no, no scripture contradicts any other scripture. And if you're affirming the truth, everything in the Bible's behind what you're affirming. And that's good advice because that gives me comfort to understand that if somebody happens to pull something like that and I wasn't quite ready for it, he said, say something about it, go home and then really bone up on it uh, and then come back devastated the next night. Well, that's, that's the way you do things. And that's how also you learn how to do things is when you recognize those particular points. We'll never encounter a situation in which our only option is to sin. Now think about that. We'll never encounter a situation in which our only option is to transgress God's law. In any situation, we can do the will of God and not commit sin. Now he's not saying that you won't suffer for it because elsewhere in the Bible plenty of times he says take up your cross daily and follow me. He told the apostles if they hated me they're going to hate you. And we know all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's not the point. You're supposed to already understand that about living life in the flesh and serving God. The Bible's full of material that says godly people suffer at the hands of ungodly people and sometimes those that purport to be godly. Do we believe in God that there is a way of escape for every temptation? Yes, I do. What I need to be doing is praying to see it. Will it take the time to go to the Bible and say, now here is the solution. God's provided the solution. Then we'll have the strength to do what we ought to do because we're already on the road to building up our strength. Now this question. Should you stop sinning? Well, you say, that's a silly thing. Should I stop? Of course I should. But now it's time to emphasize this. There is a great difference between us being humans and from time to time through ignorance and weakness violating God's will. And if one who purposely, deliberately, and steadfastly studies and does God's will. You can turn that around. A very wicked person who purposely and deliberately lives a wicked life from time to time can do a good thing. <laughs> but that doesn't make him good, does it? And so it is with the faithful child of God. What he's trying to get us to understand is that we don't make it a habit of sinning. You ever have your parents say, uh, don't make it a habit of doing that? Or maybe 
a policeman's been nice to you and he pulls you over to give you a warning ticket and says, really said, I don't make a habit of breaking. <laughs> That's what is being said here. We've, we've already established the fact that Christians can overcome sin when they're tempted. Bible tells me so. But should we feel motivated to find the way of escape? Indeed we should. Does it matter if, if we sin or not? Certainly. The Bible says don't sin. Remember the woman taking the adultery? Go thy way and sin no more. And also remember what Paul said to the Romans. Earlier in the chapter, Romans 6, he had reminded them of what they had done in becoming Christians to motivate them to faithfulness. In Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God in is eternal life. Where? In Christ Jesus our Lord. Now if you go back to the beginning of that chapter, notice how he says to these Christians in the church at Rome, and thus to everybody that's a Christian reads the New Testament, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Do you see what he's saying? The child of God is careful and wants to quit any sin. And when you want to do that and you labor to go to God's Word to get the solution to any problem and you know He's not going to allow you to be tempted above what you're able and you know the Lord said, go thy way and sin no more. He's talking about don't live a purpose habitual life of sin. Even the system, the New Testament system, can take care of the sins of ignorance and the sins of weakness. Read 1 John. If we sin, if we will confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Now, the Christian has that general attitude about his life about everything. He's constantly aware of the fact that I can commit sins of ignorance and weakness. But I'm also aware of the fact that I don't want to, I don't intend to, and I'm not setting up situations to where I will. In fact, it's right the opposite. I'm trying to obey Christ and going my way and living an habitual purpose life of sinning no more. That's the reason it irks me to no end and has ever since I heard it. When people will say, well, we're just saved sinners. That terminology is not even used in the New Testament. It's not there. It's barred from the denominations. It's warmed over denominational soup and gone sour at that. I ought to be given back to them. It's not speaking as the oracles of God. A child of God is cleansed of his sins. A child of God does not have his sins held against him anymore. The blood of Christ continually cleanses us from our sins. Because we don't want to sin. And we're doing all we can not to sin. And we're willing when we see our sins to repent of them. And we will. Because we don't want to sin. Christ has the remedy. We want His remedy. It's not burdensome. Because it leads to heaven. And that's the point that we want to make. If you want to see it even further, just go over and read 1 John. Notice again verse 7 of 1 John 1. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But that's not where that ends, is it? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But Christ said, go thy way and sin no more. Contradiction in the Bible. No. Christ is saying, don't lead a life of habitual sin where you do as you please, not concerned about the Lord's will. It's right the opposite for the faithful child of God. You don't want to sin. You're doing all you can to look for God's opening, His solution, His way out of sin. Because you know He'll not provide for you or cause you to face something that's beyond your control. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why is that such a burden for some members of the church to do? I don't know. Because the Lord's commandments are not grievous. The Lord's commandments are not burdensome. 
They're designed to get us from earth to heaven. Notice, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word, his word is not in us. What? I thought we were told not to sin. Well, if you don't sin, you're... He says, if you say you don't sin, you're a liar. Well, what are you talking about? He's talking about living a purpose, dedicated life to serving God, to obeying His commandments. You don't want to sin. You don't intend to sin. You're aligning your life with God's Word where you won't sin. From time to time, you may stumble. That's what happened to Peter. The reason Paul was stood him to the face. I know Peter repented because I know Peter continued on faithfully serving God. And I know his attitude. Have you, never noticed, have you ever noticed that? I know Peter's attitude toward Paul. Our beloved brother Paul. But it was Paul who said Peter was to be blamed. And stood him, withstood him to the face because of his conduct. Well, all they were doing were trying to abide by the whole system as Christians should. And apostles had to do the same thing. But look over here a little later in the next chapter. Verse 9, or I should say chapter 3. Whosoever, now watch this. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed, sin, get in a minute, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin. Because he's born of God. And so the Baptist rises up and pulls this passage out and says, See, once saved, always saved. The key to that, which gets so easily overlooked to understand what's being said, is his seed remaineth in him. Well, what is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11? It's the word of God. You can't sin as long as you're carrying out the will of God. You can't sin when you're complying with the commandments of God. How are you going to sin if you're obeying the commandments of God? So the purpose is, person that is faithful is the purpose who deliberately plans and purposes to learn the truth and do it. Knowing God is not going to allow him to be tempted above that which he can stand. God's for him. God's not against him. And he knows God will forgive him when he sees the sin and asks for forgiveness. And he set up a plan that is always saying that on our behalf we know we can sin. I understand that. One of the best ways to stop from sinning is for you in your own mind to say, I can. Very easy to. Because the devil goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And the devil uses the appetites of the flesh to get me to transgress God's law. I know that. No wonder Paul said, and I want to deliver a lesson on this later and develop the whole thing around this. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. I wonder why he said that. Because we know how Satan operates. We know it because we know the Word of God. How are you going to resist the devil? By the way, we're commanded to do that. How are you going to resist the devil if you don't know of his devices and if you don't know the way to resist? So again, it comes back to, am I purposely and deliberately and steadfastly and regularly and daily studying the Bible and doing His will? From time to time, I may sin. Through the weakness and ignorance. But then that's taken care of too, isn't it? If I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So Romans 6.23 makes me mindful of the fact that God has provided for me in the New Testament a way to live righteous. To go my way and sin no more after having been baptized into Christ for the remission of my alien and past sins. If we refuse to follow this plan, then we're not going to grow in the favor of God. Some believe that we can just do as we please once we become a Christian. Let me just sum it up this way. Every doctrine of a liberal, and by liberal I mean those who teach doctrines that loose us from what New Testament obligations place on us, is trying to say you can run, run neck and neck with the devil and get to, get to heaven. You don't have to be too concerned about him. After all, it's God favors you, 
and God loves you and this kind of thing. Will you stop sinning? I don't know, will you? <laughs> but I know you ought to. And if heaven's to be your home, you must. In our battle against sin, there are several constants. God's promise of a way of escape for each temptation, which we've noted several times, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Jesus is perfect example to which we can look, 1 Peter 2, 21 through 22. Knowing how God hates sin, Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, Zechariah 8, 17. And his promise to punish the wicked, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9. Let me ask you this, if you were brought up by decent parents. Did you ever do what they told you to do because you knew if you didn't, you were going to get in trouble? Well, if you didn't have parents like that, you missed a lot. <laughs> One of the incentives to serve God is, I don't want to go to hell. Now, I hear people saying, well, if you really just respond by love, then you won't have to do that. But that's handicapping the way the gospel reaches out to people. The Bible uses the idea of losing your soul in hell because you die in your sins as a way to motivate you to love the truth and do right and to keep His commandments. He's going to punish the wicked. And you who are troubled, rest with us. For the Lord Jesus shall return in mighty power when He comes back. What's He, what's he going to do? Taking vengeance on them that obey not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It says they'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of His power. Now, why is that in your Bible? Oh, it was written to Christians, remember. It tells us there's ultimate final justice that will be taken care of because vengeance is mine, God says, I will repay. If that doesn't motivate us to greater service to God, why is it in the Bible? The incentive God offers for righteousness is also the reward of eternal glory in heaven. Hebrews 11, 6, Revelation 2, 10. The ability we have to understand God's will for us, Ephesians 3 and verse 4. And the ability we have to choose to do what is right. Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we'll serve God. Joshua 24, 15, Romans 6, 16, 17. Now, notice what we have. The variable is our willingness to repudiate sin and do what's necessary to conform to God's will. There is the attitude of the child of God. Because that's how you become like Christ. There is no other way. When all is said and done, it comes down to a question of will. Always comes down to a question of will. Will you choose righteousness over sin? Will you identify and take the way of escape that exists with every temptation? Will you study God's word so that you can know what he expects of you? Will you follow the example of Christ? Will you keep your eyes focused on the reward of heaven? We must do these things if we hope to be successful in the battle against sin. And again, I, I want to emphasize, this is not saying that you can live a sinless life. It is saying you can live a faithful life. It's saying you can be steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what faithfulness is. Will you from time to time sin? Yeah, you will from time to time. But if you have the disposition we've been talking about, that time to time is not going to come as often as it might if we don't. When you, when you want to get out of sin, when you learn to hate sin, when you despise it, first of all, in your own life, then you want to follow God's situation and God's direction. As long as we live in the flesh, we will have the ability to commit sin. And because of this, God provides avenue of pardon. Non-Christians who have not believed in Christ need to, as well as repent of their sins, confess their faith in Christ, and then be baptized for the remission of their sins. And those in Christ need to be willing when they see their sins to repent of them and confess them and God will hear and forgive that's God's way why isn't it our way it ought to be 
It'll make us better. It'll stop us from sinning. Christians who commit sin have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2, 1, 1 John 1, 9, Acts 8, 22. I'm glad for that. That's comforting to know that through Jesus Christ I can go to my Heavenly Father and in all humility confess my sins, and He's faithful and just to forgive me my sins. I also know that I can live a life that is habitually involved in not sinning. Now that's faithfulness. You do that, and I promise you, you'll go to heaven. Because the grace of God is going to take care of everything else. How can it do it? Because your disposition is to abide by the truth no matter the sacrifice. To change your life no matter the sacrifice. Because none of us can live the flawless life. Not a one of us. So God's ordained a system through Christ and by the gospel revealed in the New Testament whereby we can continue to enjoy the blood of Christ that we contacted in the watery grave of baptism that remitted all our alien and past sins and continues to cover us as we walk in the light as He is in the light. If you're not a child of God, will you become one before you leave this building today? If you're a child of God and you've committed sin, you know, His second law of pardon is not burdensome. It's just simply the way that you become faithful again and get rid of any of those sins of ignorance when you become aware of them and sins of weakness. God's not going to require of us what we can't do. He's given us that which we can do. But it's going to end up where we said a moment ago. It's all a matter of want to. It's all a matter of our will. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we ask you to hear these words and go thy way and sin no more. Come to the Lord while we stand and sing.